Wonderful. I enjoyed that.
Beautiful. <laughs> I want to thank the Chinese, uh, the carolers, they were wonderful. Now, uh, what I'd like to do is get started with the evening's events. Uh, first of all, uh, we're so happy that you're able to attend our um, celebration of our new book, which was really a collaborative effort by many of you that are here and many that could not attend, uh, Teaching and Learning in Virtual Environments, Archives, Museums, and Libraries. Uh, the book was co-edited by myself and uh, Lori Bell and Rhonda Truman, and uh, they did yeoman's work, I'll tell you, uh, getting this together. So uh, it was wonderful to be able to work with them. Uh, the foreword of the book, uh, we had the uh, privilege of having Dr. Sandra Hirsch, the director of the School of Information, write the foreword uh, for us. And uh, one of the things that she talked about in there is how education has the opportunity to move beyond the traditional classroom-based learning by embracing new and evolving technology. And uh, we could see that happening here tonight. The preface uh, also points out uh, something about the contributors that I want to share. Uh, the contributors of this work are a diverse group, including instructors in multiple environments, students in graduate studies in virtual worlds, librarians who operate in virtual reality, and museum professionals who explore new avenues to reach new audiences and to display new collections and exciting materials that were previously unavailable except to those who visited museums. So uh, please uh, stop by Vicara uh, after this evening's events and wander around outside of this area and you will see a number of uh, collections and visit our museum to see a, a fantastic uh, collection that's going to be there for uh, several months now. What I'd like to do is invite uh, some of you who are here uh, to say a few words about the chapter that you wrote. Now, not everybody uh, who is here has decided they'd like to talk about it, but uh, what I would like to do uh, is uh, introduce at least the uh, title of each chapter and the author of each chapter so that you could see what went into making this terrific book. Uh, the first chapter was written by Mark Driscoll, a uh, graduate of our, our, our MAR program and uh, also a, somebody that I really enjoy working with. And his uh, contribution was a great way to start out the book, talking about digital reality and education renaissance. Now, Mark has uh, decided uh, he's new to uh, virtual worlds after all of this uh, writing in this book. Uh, he's been exploring, and so he's not yet uh, got the equipment to allow him to uh, do a presentation for us, but I'm hoping someday he will. So he's here with us, and thank you, Mark, for getting the book started out in such a terrific manner. The uh, second chapter is by Letitia DeLone, uh, Letty Luckstone. And uh, Letty wrote about uh, skilling up for teaching in 2D online and 3D virtual environments. And uh, Letty is here today. Letty, if, if you'd like to, and I'm hoping 
that you will talk a little bit about your chapter. Why don't you come up here on stage and feel free to sit down and relax in one of the chairs. Or just stand there if you if you feel more comfortable, certainly, Letty. So welcome, and please share with us a little bit about your chapter. Thank you so much. Um, well, I I don't know if it, this is the part where you want me to read excerpts, or if you just want me to kind of overview what the chapter was about. But essentially, my chapter was, um, I was looking at, because I'm a professor. So uh, you know what I look at is research. Uh, and so this chapter was basically a, coll um, a collection of research studies that kind of give a picture as to the kinds of dispositions that teachers and students have when they go into these environments. Uh, because I have found that there is actually a marked difference between uh, those that do traditional you know, face-to-face -face classroom teaching, you know, in an actual classroom where, you know, people, uh, you know, see each other versus doing like this environment, virtual environment. So I found that there were some dispositions, some kind of criteria that, that you know, people who, who do this type of teaching actually are, are different in some way. Uh, and so that's basically what the chapter was about. And it, it's, it's basically a collection of, you know, studies that show the difference between an online environment and I and I distinguish that between the virtual environment by calling them 2D, which is your your flat internet web-based um, interaction, and then you have the 3D virtual environment, which is the ones that uh, that involve worlds like Second Life, that uh, you know Open Simulator, or any uh, any other number of uh, immersive experiences where you actually get an avatar that interacts with the environment. So that's essentially how the book is kind of divided into those two main sections, uh, and then how it is that that each of them may potentially kind of look at teachers differently and look at students differently also. Wonderful. Now, can you do some readings for us? Did you pick out a few selections? Um, yeah, I've, I have a couple. I think I wanted I wanted to. to um, do the introduction and then just kind of a couple of, of sections in the middle, not too many, just just to get you a, a sense of that. So um, let me go ahead and read from the from the beginning. Um, it starts, teaching is under transformation. Such is a necessity when the educational landscape changes, the user changes, and the tools change. Educators of today now categorize teaching practices into traditional and non-traditional, and they tend to draw a line between what occurs in a four-wall face-to-face environment versus what happens in technology-oriented and virtual settings. This chapter concerns itself with the non-traditional teaching practices and dispositions of teachers who venture into this type of practice. And then uh, a little section later talks about what I mean by dispositions. Um, those who do venture out to online or virtual te teaching see possibilities rather than obstacles. Therefore, these individuals think in inherently different ways. Uh, and the different thinkings uh, that can be done are listed in seven ways. Number one, to be broad and adventurous. Number two, towards sustained intellectual curiosity. Number three, to clarify and seek understanding. Number four, to be planful and strategic. Number five, to be intellectually careful. Number six, to seek and evaluate reasons. And number seven is to be metacognitive. And then just to kind of end one final little piece here uh, from the book, it says, becoming an online teacher also requires a self-transformation an epistemic change, if you will, that further predisposes the individual to learn new tools with steep learning curves, to spend much more time preparing instruction, and to push pedagogical paradigms to meet the technological needs of our new modern society. Consequently, although a disposition may be an individual psychological construct for teachers, it is also negotiated within a given context, both by culture and by interactions and experience. And um, I'll go ahead and stop there. The rest of it goes into um, different studies. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. That was an excellent uh, summary of your chapter, and uh, your readings were uh, really thought-provoking. Uh, next, what we're going to do is go into uh, chapter three. Uh, we're still applauding. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Wendy. Uh, we're going to go into chapter three, uh, which was written by uh, two students at the time, uh, now both graduates. Uh, Jenny Crumney, who's not here this evening, and Chris Nelson, uh, who I now I'm calling Christ, so I've, I've given her a, a promotion, I think. Uh, and uh, if, <laughs> there's an error on this slide. And uh, Chris was one of the Chinese, uh, and she made arrangements for that. And much of the environment that you see around us this evening uh, was to do with Chris, Marie, and Elise. So I want to thank them all right now for that. Uh, they have declined to uh, read tonight so that we can uh, hear from some of the others who are visiting for uh, maybe the first time this evening. So we're going to move on to uh, the fourth chapter. The fourth chapter is on professional education and library connections in virtual worlds. And this is by uh, Beth uh, O'Connell or Beth Ghostraven, as you know her. Beth, come on up. <laughs> We're having uh, difficulty getting up here, Beth. Huh? <laughs> and please introduce yourself, uh, do a quick little uh, intro of your chapter, and then if you have some readings, share them with us. If you'd like to sit and relax in the chair, that's fine, or if you'd like to stand up here, that's also going to work for you. <laughs> I do like your outfit, too.
much. Uh, that was wonderful, and that's certainly a chapter that you should check out if you're wondering how to find a community to become involved with. Very nice. Yep. <laughs> Now, Chapter 5 is all about virtually abroad and second life, the use of immersive technologies for intercultural competence. That's something that our school is very involved in, taking a look at experiences uh, that provide uh, global aspects to the uh, students' uh, educational experience. So Dr. Hirsch and a student uh, who had been working with her at the time, Heidi Jackal, is now a graduate wrote chapter five. Unfortunately, uh, neither of them uh, were able to be here, uh, but that's an exciting chapter for uh, us as well. Uh, but I'm going to move on to chapter six. Uh, this one was uh, quite a privilege for me uh, to work with uh, Lori Bell on uh, some of the work that she did in courses here. Immersive Education in Second Life, uh, a case study, was her chapter. And Lori, I thought, would be here. Is she in the audience? If not, what we'll do if, if there's time and she does come later, uh, hop back uh, and uh, let her talk to you a little bit about her chapter. So. Um, I'm going to uh, just take a look at Chapter 7, uh, which is by uh, Brian Carter. And actually, that was written with Kara Carfina. I don't have that on the slide. But it was all about augmenting reality experiences through uh, digital technologies. It was a fascinating uh, chapter that uh, I had the privilege to uh, edit uh, for them. And uh, that's certainly one worth reading. Chapter 8. Uh, virtual worlds real lives using immersive environments in the classroom uh, was not written by uh, Kara and John. It was written actually just by uh, John, I believe, or maybe I'm wrong, John. You're going to correct me if you're here and come on up. Chapter 9 by John Jameson. He talked about uh, learning in three dimensions, going from a pretty, uh, which is maybe what we have here on the stage right now as you're sitting there looking at it, to participation, where people really become very involved in the environment. And uh, Chapter 9, uh, John uh, could not be with us. So I'm going to move along now to Chapter 10. Uh, we know Marie is right here up front. And uh, she's got a love for science and talks about the story of science during the scientific revolution, how you can design an educational experience uh, in a virtual world. So Marie, come on up. Good evening. Um, my name is Am Van Lapis in Second Life and Marie Vance in Real Life. Um, this particular chapter was part of an assignment that I did while I was a student at um, San Jose State University High School. And um, in fact, I just graduated this past spring. And the assignment that I had was called The Story of Science During the Scientific Revolution. And what this was, was this was a requirement um, for that class that we come up with some kind of event or um, exhibit that showed our learning in the area of um, creating educational materials um, as part of the of a library science degree. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read uh, the um, the abstract and then tell you a little bit about what's in this particular um, chapter and um, we'll go from there. So understanding how to create an interactive immersive educational experience in virtual worlds is important for those wishing to utilize these types of platforms in the future. Tackling a subject as large as science in a particular historical time frame requires understanding not only of the subject matter and instructional design, but also of the technological platform on which the instruction will occur. So in this chapter, the process of creating an educational experience in Second Life unfolds using my student exhibit, The Story of Science During the Scientific Revolution. This is an example of how such an, ex how such an experience could be designed and implemented. So what I do in this chapter is I talk about things like um, what the, I talk about the process that I used in order to create this particular um, exhibit. And if you're interested in seeing the exhibit itself, it's on 
there's a, a machinima on the Vakara YouTube channel as well as on my own YouTube channel that um, documents the the exhibit. But anyway, um, I, so I so I basically talk about the process, how I went ahead and designed it, and I show some some schematics on um, the um, the use of the space that I would use and where I would put things. I talked about the skills that are necessary when um, when designing an educational um, exhibit in, in 3D worlds and those include things like 3D modeling and software development um, and then another really important aspect is having some basic domain knowledge because it's really hard to determine what you're going to be teaching if you don't know what the domain that you're teaching in so um, this requires um, a lot of uh, a lot of time management and um, you know being able to to put together um, interesting and interesting information for people to 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 look at and then I talk about synthesis is how I put all of this stuff together and in the chapter I have a lot of pictures of the exhibit as it appeared and um, and these included things like the um, the when, when things were changing during the science scientific revolution how they went from uh, believing in monsters to more scientific approaches um, I talk about who I call the philosophers these are the people like Newton and Galileo that started the whole scientific re revolution on its on its uh, trajectory and then I talk about the experimentalists who um, were the ones who actually did all the experiments and showed us how the world really works I tried to do tried to, to highlight some women's contributions because they feel that women are a lot a lot of times are left behind when it comes to talking about science and then I talk about what I learned during um, putting this whole thing together and probably the biggest thing I learned in this situation was that I needed more time I, I spent the um, better part of two and a half months doing research and trying to get everything put together and um, in the end I had to resort to a lot of Wikipedia which I wasn't happy about oh, anyway that is um, that is my chapter and it was great talking to you thanks continue Thank you, Marie. So uh, another uh, terrific uh, overview of Chapter uh, 10. Uh, now let's uh, take a look at Chapter 11. Uh, this is by uh, J.J. Jacobson, or J.J. Drinkwater. Uh, and it's all about crowdsourcing the fictive experience uh, and narrative from a collection's perspective. The uh, next uh, chapter, chapter 12, uh, is uh, a fun one about museums in virtual worlds. And it's one that uh, Dr. Hirsch picked up on uh, when she spoke about the wonderful educational experiences students can now uh, engage in uh, in the foreword. Uh, Jeff Giorano, uh, or Aldo Stern, uh, uh, is the author of this chapter the uh, chapter 13 uh, is by um, two individuals that I'm sure you know, Rhonda Truman and Pat Alderman. And it's uh, a different approach, taking a look at writing the hype cycle about community virtual library uh, and the fact that it's turning 10. And if you're familiar with the hype cycle, it's uh, where there may be inflated expectations when we all first started out way back in, what, 2007, 2008, maybe some of you earlier. Uh, where we thought this was going to be fantastic and we kind of rode up this little uh, uh, hill until we found out that we were sliding down again uh, because it wasn't, it didn't meet our overinflated expectations. But certainly after a while in that trial of disillusionment, uh, we started thinking about real ways to use virtual environments uh, where we could make a difference with students. And so it's a smarter approach now, and uh, more people, I think, are becoming involved again, not only in Second Life, but in uh, many different types of virtual environments. So this, to me, was a, a fascinating chapter that uh, I hope you'll uh, read if you have not done so. Now, the um, next chapter is on um, 
MOOCs and virtual environments the librarians. There's a lot of interest in MOOCs, and uh, Valerie has uh, been uh, wonderful about sharing her experiences with us in uh, the iSchool about MOOCs. She wrote with uh, Irene Frank and Joe Floyd uh, this chapter that uh, is another one that I highly uh, recommend. Uh, Val is going to uh, read to us tonight, but not from this chapter. Uh, she was really productive and also wrote a chapter on her own, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, I started a um, chapter like this in another book that came out several years ago, and it was the first phase of Vakara from like 2009 to 2012. Uh, in this book, I picked up where uh, we left off with a very different approach. Uh, in the beginning, we had started with a student dedicated uh, to do the work. Uh, after 2012, uh, things changed and we started going to a team environment, which uh, I'll tell you is a lot more fun for me because whatever you see here is the result of the students who are part of the team uh, and not my vision. So uh, it, it's fun, uh, so much more fun. And so uh, you can read about our second chapter in there and someday we'll have a third chapter as well. Uh, I chose not to read from my chapter tonight. Uh, then uh, I wanted to mention um, Mary Carol Lindblom uh, and uh, her chapter is on community and education in a virtual environment. A lot of lessons learned there that will, uh, I'm sure, help any of you who are uh, interested in becoming involved or who are already involved. And, okay. and then what we're going to do is get on to the chapter that I mentioned by Val. This is the future of librarians in the digital age, and uh, librarians were so early to this uh, environment and uh, really stuck through uh, all of the ups and downs with that uh, hype cycle. And uh, I, I would like to uh, let her explain what she believes is the future of librarians in the digital age. So Val, um, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, can everybody hear me okay? This is Val. Yes. <clears throat> Wonderful. Um, yes, my uh, final chapter in the book, The Future of Libraries in the Digital Age, I'll just give a brief um, summary and then read just a little portion of it. Um, I kind of talk about the background of change in libraries and how libraries have changed so rapidly within our lifetimes. Um, some of us who are a little bit older remember card catalogs and a, and a library where most resources were in print format. I remember as a little child walking through the stacks and pulling out books and, you know, the smell of books and just the whole idea of a physical library. And that quickly in the last decade has changed to where print is no longer the king of the hierarchy. And um, most college um, students uh, state that if it's not online, it doesn't exist. <laughs> you know, they look for their all of their academic journal articles must be online or they're certainly not going to travel a long distance to go and, and find them on a shelf. Um, so, you know, libraries have, have definitely changed in a really brief period of time. And um, I like to, um, to talk about this in the sense that we all now live in global digital participatory culture. And that means we no longer live in little tiny neighborhoods with our local libraries, but we can reach out to each other across the world. And that requires new information literacy skills. Um, ACRL is currently using that term meta literacy to talk about um, the literacy skills that are needed now in this new global digital participatory culture. Yet most um, information professionals still prefer information literacy as the overarching term for the needs that users of information have. It used to be when you thought of um, literacy, it was reading and writing. Well, then that expanded to viewing and listening, and now it's expanded even more to where we are prosumers, creating and curating our own content. So this has all changed the way libraries work, certainly. And as Pat mentioned, over a decade ago, um, early adopters of virtual worlds like um, Rhonda Truman and Lori Bell and, and several others began exploring virtual worlds for librarianship and began exploring them for teaching, as well as, as many of you have um, talked about this evening, museums. 
museums, libraries, archives, education, all of these great platforms for virtual worlds. Um, I talk a little bit in my chapter about teaching in virtual worlds and about constructivist learning because um, in our new connected society where there's so much digital content, we are able to construct our own learning and, and find communities as, as Beth's chapter talks about, being able to find these great communities for learning. Um, I talk briefly about the sense of presence that we feel in virtual worlds. Most of us have experienced some online education. Teaching online and learning online can be great because if you're at 4 o'clock in the morning, you can be in your pajamas and you can still be in the classroom. That's wonderful. But most of those online learning platforms like Black, Blackboard or Canvas, they, they're still flat, 2D, mostly textual, and most of the um, interaction with each other is not synchronous. And there's no sense of presence. There's that delay of, oh, I'll catch up with the, you know, the thread later and I'll contribute. But it's not that shared sense of presence that we have here in a virtual world. I speak briefly about learning styles in virtual worlds. Just like in a physical classroom when I taught younger students, some people um, learn best with music playing. Some learn best if they have a little something to eat, a snack beside them. Some work really well in a, an informal setting where they can sit on the floor and not have to sit at a hard desk where others really need quiet. And the same goes in, in virtual environments. We all have unique learning styles and um, skills and talents. So I think um, this has all happened so quickly that thinking about how we learn, different styles of learning, all of that is important as we incorporate teaching and learning into these virtual spaces. And then I mentioned a bit about virtual reality. I have a colleague who is getting her PhD in virtual reality uh, for education. So I've tried on some of the headsets, and I know probably some of you have tried out a little bit too, Microsoft HoloLens or Oculus Rift or the Samsung Gear. But most of the experiences that I have tried with a virtual reality headset, there's no sense of presence. It's very much um, an observational oh, wow, this is so cool, I'm swimming with dolphins, or here I am in the middle of this beautiful um, beautiful space, or there's a fire or something crazy, I'm being attacked by zombies, you know, all kinds of things that you can experience with an HMD, a head-mounted device. But it's not the same as sharing the sense of presence that we have here in a virtual world. In addition to that, in, with the virtual reality headsets, so far, only the developers with programs like Unity and Unreal Engine are the ones that are building these great spaces. We, don't, we can't do that just ourselves like we can here in a virtual world. So I'm, I, it really makes me feel that the effort that we've spent for over a decade now has certainly been worthwhile. Because wherever virtual worlds end up, whether they merge with virtual reality, we have, uh, we have been pioneering a new way of learning that's definitely not going away, that will simply continue to evolve. But I think the most important thing is that we think about the best practices for this space because there's so little time and so many worlds, you know? I mean, I keep running into some of you in, in other virtual worlds beyond Second Life, and it's really hard to keep up with all of them and keep up with all of the wonderful communities and simulations that are out there. But as a librarian, I can help others do that. We can help each other um, find the best communities, find the best simulations, and, and strive toward cataloging them so that's kind of what the goal for the future is. I do have a little part here on problems with too much technology. I know all of you have, uh, all of us here realize that we don't want to waste our time on disposable media that's, you know, just quick little silly things that are trivial when, when there's so much opportunity for deep critical thinking and learning in virtual worlds. So I, I spend a little bit of time in the chapter talking about how a lot of people are struggling to balance their time with technology devices. It's become quite a problem, um, and I'll read a little bit from that. Sherry Turkle, professor at MIT, known for her research in social robots and humans interacting with technology, warns us of immersing ourselves and our children in too much technology. She believes we need to reclaim conversation and spend less time communicating through devices. She says, 
Many people are growing up without ever having experienced unbroken conversations, either at a dinner table or when they take a walk with parents or with friends. And that's in her book on uh, page 16 of Reclaiming Conversation. So there, there is a lot of people that are struggling with technology and where it's headed. And I think many of us in virtual worlds have already gotten past that that struggle because we realize technology is not going away. We have to find the best spaces for utilizing it for the best particular purposes. I talk a bit about social media as well. Um, social media, I'll read this little portion. Social media has become a part of daily life with Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and other tools literally at our fingertips. A recent study of college students showed much misinformation found on social media. The students admitted both encountering and sharing misinformation. The researchers said, sharing misinformation on social media was found to be relatively common among the sample. Indeed, a large majority of respondents, 94.7%, have seen their friends doing so. So much of the content shared on social media is meant to be simply disposable, particularly on Snapchat and places like that. However, young people also use the sites to archive pictures, anecdotes, and memories. Educators and librarians are challenged to motivate learners toward deep learning and inquiry beyond the convenience of quick an answers and constant sharing of trivial moments. Librarians can teach digital citizenship outside of physical libraries through embedding information literacy in all types of spaces, physical, virtual, and augmented. So then I go on to explain a bit about embedded librarianship and what that is and how that can be accomplished in virtual worlds. So there's a little bit from mine. I will just read the, the very last paragraph because I do think it's an exciting time. This is an exciting yet challenging time to be a librarian. The core values of our profession will withstand the changes ahead if we focus on implanting them in high quality resources and also in high quality experiences in multiple formats. Information literacy by any name is imperative to digital citizenship and each person, each individual is now personally responsible for information intake and evaluation of their information each and every day. Modeling the best practices and advocating information literacy is critical to the future. And it has become a top priority for librarians and information professionals. May we cherish the physical world and strive to care for it while pioneering the virtual world where much of life now takes place. May we continue to embed the core values of librarianship in all worlds. Thank you very much, Val. That was beautiful. Uh, and uh, you're right. Uh, the core values of librarians will not change. Uh, librarians and uh, archivists and uh, museum uh, curators and all of us who work with the uh, public will just need to find out how to deliver our message using the latest technology. Uh, I have a surprise uh, for you now. Uh, the Tiny Carolers have agreed to come back and uh, do a little more entertainment for us. And also, we have uh, skating out on the ice skating rink. Uh, in a little bit, we'll move those benches for you. And there's a skating ball out there that you can use. So uh, if you have the time, we'd love to uh, have you join us and listen some more to our entertainment. But thank you all for coming. Thank you, authors, for writing and for reading tonight. Yeah.